I'm starting now. A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of AIU and Geetam, I welcome all the vice chancellors of South India and academic officers to the second day of the conference on governance reforms and financing of higher education. Ladies and gentlemen, let me roll up the curtains to the technical session three on financing of higher education. In the chair, we have Professor M.M. Salunki, former president AIU and vice chancellor Bharti Vidyapit Pune. And we have three speakers for the session. The first speaker is Professor Jandiala B.G. Tilak, former vice chancellor NIEPA. Second in line, we have Professor Nidhima Gupta, Vice Chancellor Chhatrapati Shahu Ji Maharaj University, Kanpur. And the third speaker is Professor V.K. Jain, Vice Chancellor Tezpur University. Firstly, ladies and gentlemen, let me have the pleasure of introducing the chairperson to you. Professor Manik Rao Salunki is the Vice Chancellor, Bharti Vidyapit, deemed to be University Pune, and past president Association of Indian Universities. Mm -hmm. He has also served as vice chancellor of Shivaji University, Kolapur, first vice chancellor of Central University of Rajasthan, vice chancellor of YC, MOU Nasik. He is an acclaimed organic chemist and had more than 150 research publications, plus one patent to his credit. He has also postdoctoral research experience of having worked at Weizmann Institute of Science, Israel. University of Vienna, Austria, and Northwestern University, USA. He is fellow of Royal Society of Chemistry, Maharashtra Academy of Science, and received Best Research Award from the government of Maharashtra. Now, let me introduce the first speaker to you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jandiala B.G. Tilak, former professor and vice chancellor, National University of Educational Planning and Administration, is currently ICSSR National Fellow and Distinguished Professor at the Council for Social Development, New Delhi, India. Doctorate from the Delhi School of Economics, Dr. Tiller taught besides in the National University of Educational Planning and Administration in the University of Delhi, the Institute of Education, and as a visiting professor at Center for International Cooperation in Education, Hiroshima University, Virginia University, and Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning. Professor Tilak was also on the research staff of the World Bank and has been a consultant to many national and international bodies. Author of several books, Professor Tillard served as editor of Journal of Educational Planning and Administration, recipient of several honors and awards, including Swami Pranavananda Saraswati National Award of the UGC, Dr. Malcolm Adiseshaya Award 2003, Inspirational Teacher of the Year Global Education Award 2012, and Devang Mehta Award 2015 for Outstanding Conurbations to Education. Among many other honors, he had the privilege of delivering a keynote address in a meeting of the Nobel laureates in Barcelona in 2005. The second speaker in line is Dr. Nilima Gupta. Dr. Nilima Gupta is currently the vice chancellor of CSJM University. She has served as a professor, dean students welfare at MJP Rohilkan University, Bareilly for 35 years between 1985 and 2020. Dr. Nilma has a DSc in parasitology from Mahatma Jyoti Bhai and MPhil and a PhD in zoology Aligarh Muslim University. She has had an illustrious career for 35 years with six book, 166 publications and 270 conference presentations to her merit so far. She has been the former vice president of Zoological Society of India, Indian Academy of Environmental Sciences. Dr. Nilima has several lifetime awards and fellowships over the years to state her expertise. She's fellow Zoological Survey of India, Indian Academy of Environmental Sciences, International Society for Ecological Communications, International Consortium of Contemporary Biologists, to name a few. An array of achievements during the year 2020 for Dr. Nilima include lifetime Vignan Bhushan Samman in appreciation of environmental pollution control, Siksha with award in appreciation of her outstanding contribution to promoting education and Corona Warriors honor 
for her outstanding dedication and service to the nation and fight against corona during the entire lockdown period. Let me now bring in the third speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Vinod Kumar Jain, ex-professor JNU, New Delhi, and former Vice Chancellor, Doon University, which is uh, and is currently the Vice Chancellor of Tejpur University. A seasoned academician, Professor Jain <laughs> earned his BSc from Agra University and completed MSc from Aligarh Muslim University. <laughs> he was conferred DPhil and Sussex University, Brighton, UK. Professor Jane began his teaching career at Sussex University. Later, he served as a scientist class one in the Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Technology, New Delhi, before embarking his journey as an academician when he joined School of Environmental Sciences, JNU. Professor Jane has published 84 research publications in reputed international and national journals in the fields of plasma physics and environmental sciences and presented papers in several national and international seminars and conferences. Professor Jane has supervised 25 PhD theses and 22 MPhil theses so far now. Professor Jane has been members of many academic and statutory bodies, such as member on panel of experts of University Grants Commission, Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, Union Public Service Commission, Public Service Commission of Himachal Pradesh, and Public Service Commission of Uttar Pradesh, and so on. On this note, may I now request Professor M.M. Salunki to take the session forward. Very good morning to you all. And welcome, Salunke, sir. Welcome. Yeah. And welcome to Dr. Tilak, Dr. Jain, and Dr. Neelima also. Welcome to our AIU conference. Professor Tiruvasagam, Honorable Vice President, AIU, Secretary General, Dr. Pankaj Mittal, and fellow panelists, Dr. Tilak, Professor Neelima Gupta, Professor B.K. Chen, and I'm really happy. So, I would like to thank AIU for inviting me to chair the session during South Zone by Chancellor Meet, organized by Geetam on the team governors of governance reform and financing of higher education. I'm really happy about the team because one vice chancellor of Institute of National Education and Planning is there, another vice chancellor of Nilima Gupta from Chhatrapati Shahuji Maharaj University. I am from Kolhapur. And the name is associated from the Kolhapur. And that particular rural was the first rural who has used to spend 6% of GDP on education. And education was made compulsory. And she is representing that particular university. And third, my long associate and friend, very good environmentalist, and True sense is a uh, physicist as well as environmentalist. And Professor VK Jain, I'm really happy, excellent panel we have. The millennium has brought a significant amount of new ideas on financing higher education. Academicians are discussing mainly on six factors influencing the new trends of financing in higher education. This is according to me. There may be some more factors, but according to me, six factors are there. The first trend is regarding massive expansion in higher education system, and India is no exception. All over the world, we could see the massive expansion. Second, inability of the state to finance this massive expansion, leading to the emergence of private sector. Although the state is making an efforts to finance higher education, its share in the education budget expenditure per student has gone down drastically, preliminarily because of massive expansion. Third point, due to the inability <coughs> of the government to bear the cost pressure, some of the costs are being shifted to the parents and students with emergence of the phenomenon of cost sharing. This is, this is being achieved through the introduction and increase of tuition fees, withdrawal of subsidies, and maintenance grants 
and introduction of student loans the fourth factor is cost sharing is making the public at large and the students and their parents in particular demand value for money the taxpayers and the students want more transparency and accountability in the way the money they pay is being spent this calls for the involvement of improved financial management in financing of higher education pit point the general agreement on trade and services of the Ani world Mahashara. trade organization makes higher education a tradable community studies abroad cross border provision of higher education private in by foreign learning no curriculum na and employment of varakama illadhu kila vaani mudrukku ya are the four kinds of trade in higher education for developing countries finance should be available from abroad through governments or through private sources shifting paradigm of financing higher education the sixth point according to me is the diversification of funding sources always from the state will increase the individual cost of higher education and will widen the inequality of opportunities the state funding mechanism will have to make adjustment to face this particular challenge therefore i am sure the expert panelist will discuss the public private system merits demerits and new ways forward to meet the social and economic demand for higher education the session is planned in this particular way i will request all the panelists to stick to 10 minutes for speaker for presentation maybe you can adjust in 2 3 minutes whatever you want and then we would like to have this is very important i would like to have participation of all the other vice chancellors also so almost we'll spend around 30 to 40 minutes on this but almost 40 minutes we would like to have discussion with along with the fellow vice chancellors of the south zone <coughs> and then at the end i will give concluding remarks this will be the this is the plan by aiu for this particular session so definitely i will request professor tilak start his presentation and then subsequently dr nilima gupta and professor bk j dr tilak please thank you thank you very much mr chairman and namaskar to all the distinguished academy yeah. I'm indeed grateful to Dr. Pankaj Mittal and other friends at the AU for giving me this opportunity to speak uh, in this very important meeting of the intellectual cream of India, rather South India. Uh, well, the title of the talk is given to me. The time is also given. The duration is also given. So I'll try to be as brief as possible. It's indeed a challenging task to speak about financing of higher education in ten minutes. <laughs> Uh, but let me do uh well the theme of this meeting uh, the conference meeting of these vice chancellors is governance and financing of higher education and i'm sure there's a lot of talk about governance not only in the seminar but also in all public fora and uh, very little about finances and finances are taken as given uh even in the national policy on education 2020 which i will refer to it a lot has been proposed with respect to reforming governance structures regulatory mechanisms uh, but uh, very little about funding it's not a completely little but uh, yeah i'll come to that point how little it is how much little it is i feel that these two aspects governance and funding are related in practice uh state funding and university autonomy are said to be increasingly inversely related uh which was not the case uh, during the early decades of independence in fact they need to be positively related that both should grow both autonomy and finance should grow 
at least they need to be dealing from each other. Uh, well, the context of the present talk is already given by the chairman. Uh, I highlight the four points. Number one, I feel that there is, uh, for, the, for the quite, quite a few years, the public budget for education, whether the central government or state government budgets are put together, uh, and not only in India, in fact, in many other countries, they have been either declining marginally or declining significantly, or at best they are stagnant. But in relative terms, in proportions, and also in per, per capita terms, in real terms, they have actually declined in many places, including in India. And there are valid reasons and not necessarily so valid reasons for this. And this situation has to be contrasted with a situation which is uh, which is uh, marked by a very rapidly rising demand for higher education. Enrollments are exploding like anything. Uh, from something like 27 million in 2010 and 11, that is about a decade ago, the present enrollments are about 37 million. That is adding more than 1 million a year. And uh, now they stand around 40 million in 2018 and 19. The latest figures may be still higher. Now that everybody wants to go to higher education. As economists, the international weekly magazine from London stated, the whole world is going to university. This is a great opportunity to make the society a higher educated society, Indian society and others. Uh, and this opportunity we will miss if we do not match with funding and other relevant policies. It's also a situation where the costs of higher education are increasing, they're spiraling, both to the public exchequer and also to the students. The household expenditures have increased several times and they're compulsory payments. The government spending on higher education amounts to something like 65,000 crores in 2017 and 18, uh, which is a big money, but that is still not highly, it's highly inadequate to provide any meaningful quality education to the numbers that we have. The rising costs of higher education raise the issues of affordability, a big challenge for the education administrators as higher education is also to be seen as an important instrument to promote mobility and ensure the equality of opportunity. And we also, I also note that among the many, many components of educational budgets, the research is one which is relegated to the background, quite unfortunate trend. So the main question that has been asked Couple of, couple of decades ago still remains very dominant. Who should pay? The state should pay, or students should pay, or others should pay. And others, in fact, is a sector which we do not have in India, not certainly not prominent. It used to be very prominent in the early decades of independence, but not anymore. So the question remains whether the state has to fund or the students have to fund, or what should be the mix? This question continues to be a dominant one, and unfortunately, theory does not help us to do to solve this problem. There are piecemeal measures of, of reforming funding mechanisms through performance budgeting and others, but they are still piecemeal measures. The National Policy on Education of 2020 has made some good statements, even though they are not uh, as, as many reforms as suggested, in the, as suggested in case of governance. Rather, it is very, very heartening to hear this, to see the statements like education, the public good. I find that this is a particularly important statement because no other public policy document in the recent past that I know, recent or past, in India has referred to education clearly as a public good. The policy also stated that public education system is the foundation of a vibrant democratic society, quote unquote. It also makes clear strong statements that the policy commits to significantly raising educational investments as there is no better investment towards the society's future than the high quality education of our young people. In fact, the policy unequivocally endorses, I quote, and envisions a substantial increase in public investment in education by both the central government and state governments. The center and the states will work together to increase the public investment in education sector to reach 6% of GDP at the earliest. And I think this is considered, I underline it, extremely critical for achieving the high quality and equitable public education system uh, that is truly needed for India's future economic, social, cultural, intellectual, and technological progress and growth. And I find that these are very, very noble statements.
And I feel that if all the actors in higher education in India are sincere to these statements and if necessary action follows, I'm sure miracles will happen in higher education. That we, the, the policy identified fund, care funding, investment in teacher education and universities to foster excellence, cultivating research, extensive use of technology and online education. And all this is in addition to one-time expenditures to improve infrastructure in the university systems. I mean, the, there are many other statements that the policy made, but I think uh, quantitatively two are very important. One is already referred to, which is the 6% of GDP, the recommendation that was made long ago by Qatari Commission in 1966. And uh, it was a commitment of the 68 policy, but which was later reiterated often and often. It also, in fact, the policy clearly recognizes the importance of research and the proposed uh, setting up of National Research Foundation. Initially, the policy committee has suggested something like 20,000 crores of rupees, but luckily the 2020 union budget has allocated something like 50,000 crores of national, for the National Research Foundation. So there is some interest in with respect to promotion of research, which is an important one. The policy also recommends that the policy calls for regeneration, active promotion and support for private philanthropic activity in the education sector. And it still continues. In particular, over and above the public budgetary support, which would have been otherwise provided to them, any public institution can take initiatives towards raising private philanthropic funds to enhance educational experiences. The private philanthropic sector must be encouraged and enabled to play a significant and beneficial role in the development of education. It says that opportunities for high cost, and it also goes on further and says that opportunities for higher cost recovery without affecting the needy or deserving sections will also be explored. In fact, I have some problems with the higher cost recovery, while with respect to many other statements, I'm completely in agreement. Um, it is already high because the high cost rate of recovery is already high in India compared to many other countries. We note that in some public universities, all fee contributions from the students account for more than 50% of the recurring costs of the universities. In many European universities, it is much less than 15%. And some, some, states, some countries provide, of course, free higher education. Among the cost recovery measures, of course, fee is very important. Dr. Justice Punaya Committee, long ago in 1992, has suggested that the students' fee revenues and other resources may constitute up to 20% of the total recurring expenditure of the universities. As I said, we forget about others because there is no others in India. So this was suggested for the central, this recommendation was made for the central universities, but I feel that this can be taken for all universities mm -hmm. and higher education institutions in the country. And the 20% should be considered as the maximum desirable limit as maximum desirable limit, as beyond this, I'm, I, I, I fear it will create problems of inequalities in access to higher education, particularly in a highly unequal society like ours. It will also change the motives of the students more towards pecuniary benefits and self-interest than human and national values. So I think the 20% should be taken as a maximum limit. Um, I, I do not find this very good, a very good practice. And universities should not look at really distance education programs, self-financing programs, and, and similar other activities as essentially revenue generating activities. And that has been the trend, unfortunately. After all, under all these modes also, higher education has to be provided as a public good, ensuring quality, equity, and growth. Second, I feel that universities should tie up with the national banks because educational loans is another measure of cost recovery that we have been for practicing. So I feel that universities may tie up with the national banks to facilitate the smooth and easy availability of educational loans to students. And some private universities do, of course, but it can be applied to all universities. Apart from government subsidy on interest for poor students, universities, particularly private universities, may offer for additional subsidies on interest on educational loans for the poor. And I feel that that would be a very worthy consideration if, they, if it can be taken up. The third sector that is the others in funding higher education philanthropic contributions about which the policy is highly optimistic. I feel that that's 
virtually non-existent in India, unlike in the West. And now that the policy refers that universities must make special efforts to tap this particular source, which was quite sizable, as I said, in the 50s and 60s, uh, I think we should try to think of some special innovative measures to tap this source. Um, universities in India, of course, have developed really strong relations with the community uh, that will also help in generating more resources. I'll make one or two other suggestions and then try to wind up. And when I see the university budgets uh, at the university level, at the state level, and of course, central level also, I'll, com I'll comment upon. Among the many items I find that there are two important items that need to be highlighted. One is the scholarships. And this amount of scholarships that is the, the proportion of scholarships as a budget item of the universities is very, very small. I find that as a thumb rule, about 10% of the total recurring budget of the universities should be allocated to the scholarships. That will help the needy students and also reward the merit. Both purposes would solve. In fact, they should make a really sizable allocation of resources to scholarships because that's an important activity that one has to do. The second important item that I find which is very crucial for good higher education system is research. And very few universities and very state, few state governments. In fact, I should say that at the state level, in the state budgets, if you look at it, I'm, I'm really surprised. Uh, the scholarships and research do not figure. Research does not figure at all. There's no budget item at all in many state government budgets. So like scholarships, I feel that with respect to research, the university should allocate at least about 10% of the university budgets uh, for the research of the faculty and students. This will promote quality and excellence and will have very, very strong effects uh, on, this, on strengthening the higher education system in the country. While central government's budgets have some budget, some, some amounts, not really very big ones for these two categories, the state budgets for higher education have make hardly any allocations. As I said, there are no heads even in some of the state, in many state budgets for, for research in higher education. I also feel that the universities at the institutional level, there should be some very rigorous institutional planning. It is necessary that universities develop long-term plans at least five-year plans, along with five-year financial plans. Many universities make plans, but they do not make financial plans for long. They have only financial statements. Um, so the five-year financial plans will help a lot with respect to the, the condition of financing of university systems. Um, I know that the grants and budgetary resources are allocated only yearly, but still I feel that plans, including financial plans for five years will help us uh, better better running the university systems to know the future of the university is much better. I feel that we really need long-term planning with respect to higher education at the, at the macro level and a careful planning. Uh, why I say this particular point is in the recent, not only in the recent past, for the last couple, more than two, three decades, we have expanded the number of universities and colleges really too much. We note in particular in particular areas like engineering education and the center and the state are trying to do something with respect to this. But I feel that it's not only with respect to engineering colleges, but even central universities, state universities and colleges would have expanded too much. In fact, Philip Altbach has recently written an article in the Hindus uh, stating that the expansion of the IAT system, which we did in 11th and 12th year plans, has not been a good idea at all. But according to him, it has weakened the overall IIT system in the country, quite unfortunately. And I think similarly with respect to the expansion of the central university system that has happened. And also, of course, state universities. We have too many universities. Many states have really clear targets of having more than one university in each district. And I think we are almost planning, university planning uh, like school planning, primary schools at every village, so universities in every district. And not just one university. In fact, we have more than one university per district. And these universities are with small enrollments, limited number of departments, three or four, because that's a minimum requirement by the University Grants Commission, and extremely small faculty, full-time faculty. Now, I find that there is no purpose of having such institutions. What kind of academic excellence one can think of from these institutions, which are severely underserved and under-resourced? 
I feel that uh, it's not economically, of course, it, it helps a lot if we have big universities with big enrollments. That's what the national policy on education also suggested. Uh, the, but also much more importantly, not only economically, but also with respect to academic aspects for the development of knowledge, these small institutions do not serve the purpose. They are quote unquote viable. I feel that in fact, the academic costs could indeed be much higher than the financial costs or financial losses. And one should really recognize it. I end up with a few bottom line thumb, thumb points. We need some innovative approaches to higher education finances without losing the sight of the fundamental public good nature of higher education. And I repeat this particular point that we must recognize higher education is a public good, not a private good and not a business. Education is also a spending department and not a revenue generating department. And we should look at, at the macro level at the, and at the institutional levels, not as cost centers, but as a spending department for the service and for the welfare and service of the, of the society. It's an investment, of course. We also know that education is costly and quality education is costly. And we must be ready to put more resources if we want to have really good quality higher education. We have really great ideas, great aspirations of developing world-class universities, world-class university system in the country of high quality and excellence. I feel that universities have twin objectives of pursuing excellence and at the same time ensuring equity and social justice. I says it's a big challenge, but there's no option. And I personally feel that if we recognize the imperatives and recognize that the alternatives are really costlier, alternatives of providing, alternatives to providing good quality education, that is providing low quality education with such universities and et cetera, et cetera, are indeed costlier for the society. And uh, we will have to pay the longer and too much for that. Once we are aware of it, we should be able to find resources on how to do, how to provide good quality education, equitable quality of education to all. The kind of a goal that's of course repeated very often and the national policy and education has made it very much more clearly. Well, Mr. Chairman, I stop. I, I know that I a little bit exceeded the time, but not really very much. And thank you very much for giving me the time and I'll be available for questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tilak, for exclusively talking about education as a public good cool, and now giving all the details. Now I request Professor Nilima Gupta, Madam, to give her presentation on this particular issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, the chairperson of this meet, Professor M.M. Uh, Salunki, who is the former president of AIU and Vice Chancellor of Bharti Vidya Beat Pune, the dynamic and energetic Secretary General of uh, AIU, who has uh, taken the grip of higher education in her hands since uh, ever since she joined AIU, Dr. Pankaj Mittal, uh, esteemed speakers of uh, today's uh, session, Professor J. B. G. Tilak, the former Vice Chancellor of NEPA, whom we just heard. Professor V. K. Jain, the Vice Chancellor of Tezpur University. Uh, all esteemed Vice Chancellors of the South Zone who are present here. I feel delighted to be a part of this uh, meet, uh, which is being organized by AIU uh, in an endeavor to speed up the uh, implementation of the National Education Policy uh, 2020 in five of its uh, zones, one of which is being held here. And I very much look forward to the final or uh, national conference, which will uh, be held, summing up the ideas of all these five uh, zonal conferences. Uh, talking about uh, financing of higher education, that is what I suppose that we are uh, able to discuss during this meet. So I shall try to be very brief and uh, through uh, a, a, a few slides, I shall try to uh, express my views. Is 
Is the screen visible? The chairman, sir, is the screen visible? Please, go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. So we shall be uh, talking a little bit about financing of uh, higher education in India. And I do uh, feel that uh, the implementation of the uh, implementation of the national education policy, this is one of the very important parameters which should be taken into consideration when we talk about the implementation of the policy. Now, uh, uh, we have a number of challenges uh, in higher education. All of us know about the National Education Policy 2020. All of us are worried about how we should implement it. But here, it, uh, through this uh, small uh, slide which I'm presenting here, we have a number of factors which are a challenge in uh, the implementation of higher, uh, uh, the national education policy. But we do have this in, inadequate financial support. It acts as a very big factor when we talk about the implementation of the policy. In fact, financing of higher education in India has been a complicated problem due to theoretical and practical problems. It is declining at the same time when the needs of the higher education system have been growing very rapidly. It is being increasingly realized that public budgets cannot adequately fund higher education. I'm of, the very, uh, of a very strong opinion when we talk about public budgets, because ours is also a state university. I'm in fact looking after a state university here, uh, Chhatpati Shaoji Maharaj University, which is a public university. But I'm sorry to say that we do not receive any grants from the state government to run this university. And we have to manage the finances entirely from our own resources. Fortunately, we have a large number of colleges, uh, more than 1,000 colleges, and we are able to meet out. But if we talk about the development of the university as such, then the finances of uh, to meet out these expenses pose uh, a big problem. Uh, if this is the situation, then we should think about uh, how we can uh, raise the funds of uh, these institutions. So um, we have to look into several factors. Like here, I have seen that uh, we, we have to ha have new consumers and rapidly increasing revenues. Product service uh, has to be launched in, in the market. Uh, we have to establish consumer base and stable revenues. We have to have product service uh, gaining market transaction, and we have to work on certain ideas or prototypes. So this is just to show you uh, how, what are the mean annual er earnings in uh, rupees if we go back uh, to, uh, to the years. And this shows these different, like these, this is the sector where there is no education at all. Then we have the primary education, the secondary education, and finally this is the um, university education. Uh, in India, uh, the education in India, if we, we're, right now we are concerned more about the economic aspects, but Ultimately, it has to be linked up with the society also. A country's educational system is its main means both of perpetuating the values and skills of its population and of preparing it for progress and development of the country. Education system, besides being dependent on the prevailing goals of different sections of the society, it is dependent more or less on the size of the nation's budget and its fiscal capacity and on its general political and administrative system. Uh, uh, Professor Tilak was also talking about uh, these funds which are being uh, generated or which have been allocated for education and we have to go on to a target of uh, about 6%. If we look at the scenario of different countries, we find that uh, if we talk about USA and uh, uh, China, we find that they spend about 2.8 and 2.3% of their uh, annual uh, G GDP on education. And uh, whereas in India, the figure is much below. Even the small countries like Korea, they are spending about um, 4.3 and 4.8% of their budget. So uh, the inadequate investments in higher education as a proportion to the GDP have been witnessed in the past and the total government expenditure on a higher education is 2.7%, while the entire private sector expenditure on higher education is mere 0.2% of the GDP. We have a massive expansion of the higher education. We are talking about uh, uh, the increase in the number of universities. We are talking about giving autonomy to all the institutions. There may be even uh, small colleges, but this is uh, here in the table. We see the number of educational institutions, the number of universities, central, central open universities, NIP, uh, 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 institutes of national importance, public universities, and all these deemed universities and all. So we have right now about 900 
193 universities in the country. And with this massive expansion of, expansion of higher education in the recent times, it has become a challenging opportunity due to financial squeezing in all these uh, universities. So, uh, and as I was just telling you, uh, the private higher education institutions, they are funded almost entirely by the student fees. And as per a study published by Ernest and Young in 2018, India is reported to have about 140 million young college goers before uh, 2030. So this is a pretty high number and we have to cater to their needs. Uh, we have to cater to provide them with a good quality education. Therefore, increased levels of public funding support for public HEIs would definitely be required. Raising private, uh, private philanthropic funds is a need of the hour to enhance educational experiences. So we have to look into these parameters as to how we can basically increase the funding. In, uh, in 2019, uh, um, an RBI report, uh, State uh, Finances, a study of budgets, shows that the Delhi government's expenditure on education increased dram dramatically to over 20% of its budget outlay since the financial year 2015. The only other state that stood up in the table was Assam with a history of spending over 20% since the financial year 2003 and the other states are far behind. The finance minister uh, Nir Nirmala Sitha Ramanan has, has allocated uh, uh, um, uh, an amount of 39,466.5 crore towards higher education last year, which is a 3% increase from 1920. So we do look forward that this year uh, we will have more grants on education. As per NEP 2020, 6% of GDP should be spent on education. All of us have been repeating that, that now and again. Uh, uh, what are the global trends? Let us try to have a uh, picture. Um, uh, uh, in the entire world, we have seen that industrialized uh, countries, they have started uh, spending on education mainly through its public finances and government intervention in the beginning of the 19th century. Many of the countries, we find that there is a complete uh, public funding for the universities. The USA primarily engages government funding for education. In France, by 1881, the fiscal burden shifted from local government to central government. By 1990, government spending in many developing countries was at par with developed countries. And the 20th century marked the expansion of education globally and a reduction in inequalities. European countries assign more of education budgets to the secondary and tertiary levels. In low income countries, households contribute more to primary education than to higher levels. The largest part of funding is devoted to current expenditures, mainly compensation of staff, specifically it is the teachers. Greater investments in the infrastructure, teacher training, instructional materials is required. I think this is really very important because we are talking today with uh, the NEP 2020 and what COVID-19 has taught us that we are going online. Like today also, we are meeting online. Otherwise, these uh, all these uh, AIU meetings, they were always held uh, offline. So we need a, uh, a better infrastructure. We need uh, a be better internet con connectivity. We need better teacher training who can cope, cope up with the changing times. And we have to have better instructional materials because all universities today require smart classes for the dissemination of knowledge, which earlier was not a must. Studies show that expenditure on education does not explain learning outcomes, uh, which, which has shown by earlier publications. So India lags behind several other nations. If we, just, we can just see uh, these are the data of se several other countries. So we lag behind several other nations such as USA, Norway, uh, Norway, Germany, UK, France, Spain. Because ultimately, when we talk about education in India, we have to see the global picture uh, and we have to compete with, uh, with the other countries as well. Higher education has generally been recognized as a public good. People say that what is higher education? It is a public good. This warrants that the state should play a more active role in the financing of higher education. However, Owing to several factors, state funding due to higher education has been declining in real terms because the demand has been increasing. I feel that the reason behind it, because the demand for uh, higher education is increasing over the years, the gross enrollment ratio is also going up. So uh, we, we have to have more of state funding for the institutions. The financing, uh, financing trends have uh, not been favorable since the 1990s. And post-1991 phase was marked by fiscal squeezing, particularly in higher education. 
Now, what would happen? We are talking about universities having good funding, but what would happen if we have poor funding? So these, I, I think the, we have five of these possibilities. The government schools and colleges have poor infra infrastructure because they do not have funds. Say for example, building, library and labs. And I feel all three are important to run a good institution. There are large vacancies of teachers. If I, if I can just tell you about the situation in Uttar Pradesh, where we find the, uh, uh, it, it may be school education, it may be higher education. We have a large number of uh, vacancies, even for the appointment of principals. A high presence of low paid, non-regular ad hoc teachers with no job or se social security. This It is a really a very pitiable picture because we find, especially as I was talking to you uh, uh, about our affiliating colleges, these affiliating colleges, they have very low paid, non-regular uh, ad hoc teachers. They do not know about the future. And obviously, when a teacher is not stable, definitely the quality of teaching, definitely the quality of education will suffer. A high level of segregation of students and commercialization of education. We see that because there is no public funding, what happens ultimately? The institutions which are running, they simply try to uh, squeeze out money from the students. This, uh, they have become, uh, they have made education simply very much commercial, just like any other uh, commercial product. HRD, now known as the Ministry of Education, is grappling with the lack of funds, has proposed new modes of generating funds in its five-year plan, titled Education Quality Upgradation and Inclusion Program that is EQUIP uh, from 2019 to 2024. As for EQUIP, the requirement of financial resources in higher education can be daunting if all this has to be publicly funded. Innovative ways of financing could be philanthropic, provision of tax deduction, matching fund from public and corporate, public funded uh, institutions to generate internal revenue, alumni funding, etc. In fact, all these need a lot of discussion, but due to paucity of time, I'll just uh, uh, mention about these points. Financial resources through philanthropy and alumni must be treated as extra budgetary resources because we can gain re revenue through philanthropy and alumni. GST and all educational services therefore needs to be removed, but right now GST is uh, uh, applicable on all educational institutions. So the, le the level of expenditure um, as po the percentage of GDP, I'll just uh, uh, go fast because uh, I'm running out of time. So this shows a picture during the previous financial uh, years, but now we have to increase the funding. Uh, what I've been uh, uh, speaking in many of the public fundings is that uh, on, uh, on uh, several occasions is that we do have, we can increase our funding. So these are the government agencies through which we can get funds. And also we should have in every university, I would suggest that we should know from where we can get good funds because many of the universities, they're ignorant. They do not know from where we can get um, good grants for the running of the university. RUSA, RUSA that is Rashtriya Uchitar Shiksha Abhiyan. This has also been set up with objectives of development of faculty wise PG buildings for the colleges. They have given grants for buildings. They have equipped the classrooms with modern facilities like smart classes. We have two of them in our university funded by RUSA. Establishment of central library having latest various as, uh, subject books and periodicals with their cyber facility. Now we must have the um, uh, software for um, all sorts of softwares and we must have e-books and e-journals. We should equip our libraries. Establishment of modern central computer center in the college and RUSA is funding for that. Development of common room auditorium girls hostel, cafeteria, and toilets in the college campus. All these funds are provided by RUSA. So I'm sure that the universities are able to uh, get funds from these. And of course, we have the World Bank. I'm not going to read these out because in line with the sustainable development goal for education, we have to uh, address the uh, learning outcome challenges, uh, challenges and we have to look towards uh, the World Bank. We have to uh, have the required uh, areas for financing is a collaborative research where we can uh, earn revenue for research projects. We must have grants. We must have travel and publication grants for seminars and conferences. Digital infrastructure today has become a must. We must have scholarships and fellowships so that we can promote those students who do not have access to proper funds. And uh, uh, we have these bright uh, scholars. 
who uh, who can readily take up higher education we should have incubation facility like here in our university we have allocated eight crores of money for incubation and entrepreneurship cell so uh, i i would request that all universities should promote this so that we can have a, um, a better quality of higher education and we should also promote industrial visits because ultimately our uh, students have to collaborate with the in industries so just to uh, sum up these are uh, how we can uh, improve our finances of the education institutions as prescribed under NEP 2020. Affiliation of colleges is one of the prime sources. All the underfunded state universities like ours, we are getting revenue only from these affiliated colleges. Clustering of affiliated colleges can be a means to improve resource utilization between the networks of colleges after resource and infrastructure mapping, linkages between higher education and technical education for resource sharing and funding support and endowment from private corporate philanthropic funds by bringing it under the uh, CSR clause of companies acts. These are essential and we have to have a fixed percentage for consultancy to be contributed to the university fund. Rented physical facilities for auditorium, sports complex, swimming pools, we, we can generate funds out of that. And also we can have central instru instrumentation facilities through which we can uh, generate funds. Rented shops through that also we can uh, generate uh, revenue. Central instrumentation facilities I was just talking about. And we can have PPP model for certain facilities. Uh, research incubation in problem areas related to uh, uh, university uh, setup, interna internationalization of higher education. This is also very important because many of our students uh, who are going out, this is, uh, I feel, uh, we, we are giving very good loans. Now, the earlier speaker was also talking about giving loans and we are giving loans to our students. Um, for both the categories, for those students who want to go abroad also, and those students also who want to stay in India, I would suggest that we give uh, better loans to the students who are uh, studying in India so that we can promote our students to get a better quality of education while staying in India, and we can prevent the uh, our students, uh, our uh, the cream of our students who, who are going out to other countries. The shortfall in public spending can be covered by the NGOs and overseas investors, ta tax exemptions for donations to higher education centers. And I was also talking about alumni funding, which is very important. And each university can get a lot of funds through alumni, only we, that we have to approach them. So th these are the graphs for how we are get, uh, funding the, uh, the institutions during the past years. And uh, we have to, uh, this, this I've just tried to sum up for our state, that is Uttar Pradesh, the state higher education. Yes, madam. Madam? Hello? Hello, madam. You are not audible. Sir, I think temporarily a network connection has gone. Okay. So shall I uh, request Professor Jane? Wait for a second. Maybe she comes back. Because she was at the end of its, uh, her presentation. Madam, what I will do during discussion, we can have if some points are remaining, I will request the madam to continue. So meanwhile, uh, she has given some really good suggestions about the financing in higher education, as well as she's talked about global mega trends regarding the financing. So now I will request Professor VK Jain to have a discussion on this very important issue. 
being in central university he can give some different perspective thank you well thank you professor salunke uh, madam dr pankaj mittal um, and uh, fellow panelists and all other vice chancellors who are uh, connected uh, in the virtual mode in this important uh, event uh, i think my predecessors uh, have actually covered uh, the earlier speakers have covered practically uh, everything uh, which in fact i was uh, uh, thinking of sharing uh, with you but some of the points already have been mentioned by these two esteemed uh, speakers professor tilak and uh, professor neelima gupta but nevertheless i would just like to uh, supplement uh, some of the things uh, which i have in mind uh, and add to uh, add to the uh, deliberations um the some statistics was given by professor gupta uh, it just shows that how uh, complex and diverse our ecosystem is higher education ecosystem is and uh, given the plethora of the regulatory agencies the challenges uh, before the higher educational institutions uh, whether they are central universities or the state government universities or the private universities or the deemed universities and what have you the challenges as far as the funding is concerned uh, they continue to be uh, of a serious nature but if you look at the current uh, funding patterns uh, in all the higher educational institutions uh, i can speak certainly with certain confidence about the central university uh, central university system at the moment the government gives us funding only uh, under the salary head um, then there is a recurring head uh, and uh, under the capital assets head we get a bit of funding for minor equipment and minor upgradation of the uh, infrastructure uh, but as some of you are already aware that uh, to meet our other uh, infrastructure needs or the expansion of the infrastructure we have to now take loan uh, from hefa and then there are two windows window 3 and window 4 and in the window 3 the government uh, pays the interest whereas the central uh, university pays the principal but the principal is to be paid after 3 years of the completion of that infrastructure project but in the window 4 the uh, both the uh, the interest as well as the principal is taken care by the government and the recent uh release of grants under uh, ews category to the central universities uh, has been under window 4 one of the probably the recommendations uh, could be that maybe these private universities could also be um, be uh, allowed to access the funding through hafa that would be one of the recommendations i don't know how the government would uh, look at this but uh, certainly there is a case for for uh, meeting the uh, requirement of funding for additional um, infrastructure through hafa uh, but one of the issues which i feel the state universities or the state government uh universities across the country would face is uh due to the fact that in the new education policy there is not going to be any affiliated colleges some of the big older universities uh under the state governments they have many uh, affiliated colleges and professor gupta did mention that one of the major sources of revenue for, in case of her university happens to be this this uh, affiliation now if that is going to be done away with some of these universities are going to face the serious challenge 
uh, you know, to how to just compensate uh, for, for this loss of revenue. Now, under the NEP, as you are all aware, there are some major structural reforms uh, um, with regard to the regulatory framework, with regard to the curriculum, with regard to the, the way the grants are going to be dispersed to uh, institutions in the higher education sector. Uh, the, if you look at the clause 18.5 uh, of the NEP, it does uh, mention that uh, the third vertical of the Higher Education Commission of India will be the uh, Higher Education Grants Council, which will carry out funding and financing of higher education based on a very transparent criteria, including the IDPs. This is uh, the institutional development plans of which even Professor Tilak, I think he mentioned in his, uh, in his uh, uh, talk. Um, then, so, so every institution then will have to prepare uh, a institutional development plan for five years, for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. And if you look at the essence of NEP, uh, in fact, it centers around four uh, or five major uh, um, reforms. One is to do with the curriculum reform, and it talks about multidisciplinarity. The second one is the uh, uh, enhancement in the uh, gross enrollment ratio. The third is the uh, embedment, uh, embedding the embedding the skill and vocational component in your curriculum. Uh, and the fourth is that your R and D has to be uh, uh, incubation and innovation driven. Now, if you are going to have all these four or five themes. I mean, if, you are, if the institutions are going to uh, incorporate all these th four or five themes in your institutional development plans, of course, it would require a great deal of uh, funding. And uh, the government, on its part, to be fair to them, they have uh, uh, they are they are conscious of uh, of this requirement of additional funding, which is to be provided to all the institutions so that they are in a position to implement uh, the NEP. But there are certain, um, certain things which the institutions without uh, having recourse to additional funding, they can, they can uh, bring about uh, the certain reforms uh, with the existing resources. But I would just uh, like to maybe uh, I would not call it that I'm going to create a controversy or something, but certainly this is something, a very offbeat kind of uh, suggestion. Uh, often it has been said by everyone that uh, education is a public good and therefore the major responsibility lies with the government. Yes, this is true. But, you know, at the same time, then you talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, talk about this, uh, private public partnership then you talk about uh, you know this uh, equity for uh, startups uh, venture capital for startups i do not see any reason why the higher educational institutions should not be allowed to have access to equity market why can't they raise funding through equity uh, maybe some regulatory uh, mechanism with regard to uh, this could be uh, put in place, but certainly, um, yes, one of the one of the uh, probably uh, very novel way of attracting funding could be could be through access to equity markets. I think educational institutions depending on their reputation. In fact, it would increase a great deal of competition among them. Let them, uh, let them go for uh, generating funds through uh, uh, equity. Of course, a plethora of measures were mentioned by Professor Neelima Gupta, uh, the, the corporate uh, social responsibility, the, you know, some of the fiscal incentives she talked about. 
um, alumni funding and various uh, you know other uh, very uh, well thought out uh, uh, you know measures which she she had her in presentation uh, but i would just add to that that maybe the private uh, equity should could also be uh, allowed to be accessed so with this i i i conclude uh, professor salunke and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity sir you are on mute sir you are on mute salunke sir salunke sir you are on mute you have to unmute salunke sir please unmute Oh, <laughs> I'm really sorry. Uh, thank you, Professor Jain, for lucid discussion on Window Three, Window Four, and also talking about the problem of de-affiliation under new education policy. Now there is a, some time is left for this open house discussion. I will request first to Professor Deepak Moon. He has already put some question in the chat box from. op jindal university i will ask him he can unmute and ask the question uh, he has raised to professor gupta madam uh hello sir uh, am i audible yeah 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 please you are audible okay 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 i had a question uh, yeah, for yeah, professor tilak also but any, anyways i'll uh, read uh, but i've written for professor gupta yeah, uh, ma'am yeah. you have said that uh, your university being a state university does not receive any funding from the government which right. it should but it does not and uh, uh, you also mentioned a large number of affiliated colleges which i understand uh, contribute significantly through affiliation fees and examination fees right. so right. Uh, if if you can uh, give an idea of uh, around what percentage of your budget uh, Uh, or revenue comes from these uh, affiliated colleges. Hundred, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. We meet all our expenses <laughs> from these colleges only. As wow. Because so, so, so. we are a profit university, and the state government does not uh, give any funds. I mean, they may give uh, like um, uh, for di uh, different activities and all. Like we got mm -hmm. uh, for the center of excellence, we got three lakhs of rupees uh, right now. That's, That's not a huge amount. That's yeah, minuscule. it's very small. Or we got grants from the Rusa. But uh, talking about the salaries of our teachers, which the state government should—that is the basic yeah. thing. Pension of our teachers, the government is not doing anything. We have to pay on our own. So that is uh, <laughs> all met from our own resources. So after uh, NEP 2020, like uh, you have given several suggestions and uh, yeah. a, a long list. Have you tried anything uh, till now? Uh, yes, from yes, we are trying. We are trying. Like uh, we are trying to. Um, I told you we are uh, also working on skill development, and we are trying to generate uh, our own entrepreneurs. We give them a, sm a small fund, and two of our experiments have become very successful. They are running right now. One is. Second thing is from central organizations. Uh, like we got some grants from uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment. Uh, to the tune of about uh, 60 lakhs, we got from there, and uh, a number of other projects are also running. So we just try to meet uh, these expenses, we, and uh, we also created. I, I was focusing on the alumni grant. So um, uh, in fact, this our alumni was not registered. So we got it registered, and I'm very happy to say that the president of India, he is an alumni of our university. We had our first alumni meet, and he gave us one lakh. One thousand rupees from his personal uh, resources. So that is, we should have a corpus fund. What I mean to say is, we can generate. We are also working on that so that we can generate some funds through the alumni. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma Thank you. Now Thank we'll you. have some fresh, uh, discussion from other participants, please. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, in fact, yeah. Deepak has asked uh, Dr. Yeah, yeah, Deepak. Please, please. Go ahead. Another question. Can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, Dr. Deepak has asked the question that uh, tax rebates already exist to generate philanthropic contributions. What else can be done? Number one, I think we have 
uh, at least in the policy, it was stated very ambitiously that we should get more and more philanthropic contributions. And uh, which in the present context, it looks very doubtful to get really substantial funds from the philanthropic contributions. Having noted this, I would like to underline the point that uh, it is not the tax rebates. Uh, it is not the returns that the those who give the donations to the institution will get. I think we should appeal to the common people that education is really a very important, noble activity. Uh, it's a great service to the people, service to the nation. Once we inject that particular kind of feeling, and this is not a new thing that I'm saying. Earlier, it was highly respected. Teachers are highly respected. Education is highly valued. So once we resurrect this particular feeling among the people, I think then the private philanthropic contributions will come. On the other hand, if you say that, yes, it is an investment that you make it and then you will get some returns, you make a, a donation, then you will get the tax rebate, etc. That's not bad, but that's only a small part of it. There are a large number of people who should be interested in giving donations to the education institutions if we appeal to this particular feeling. After all, people are paying to the religious temples, temples in a big way. So people will be ready to do it. The second point that I would like to state is, it is, uh, if the educational institution is serving very well, is working very efficiently well, and if it has a good image, then people will be coming forward to give donations. Okay. The best institutions get the money. The best institutions get the public money and also get the money from the, from the donations, etc. And the poorly, inefficiently run institutions do not attract any money. We have this evidence very clearly. Some IITs got it, some central institutions got it. And now, um, uh, Mrs. Sukhmini was saying this, she got some money from the Papa President of India. But I think uh, only if you, if you say that the institution is running greatly and we are serving the nation very, very efficiently, I think then people will do. The unfortunate problem is a large number of universities are not able to project that particular image that we are doing really great things. So if well, excellent institutions get more, much more money and poor institutions will suffer. Thank you, Thank you. Professor Thank you, Now I will request Professor Gautam Rao to ask his question, what he has raised in the chat box. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. It's not a question per se. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm just raising, uh, I mean, uh, just expressing my opinion on the earlier suggestion that uh, private equity should be explored to finance the, you know, HEIs, including the universities. The challenge we will have is unless you have been running the I main university as a business generating adequate surplus year after year, any effort to invite uh, private investors to contribute in the form of equity will be unsuccessful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because even for us to raise the equity, we need to convince the invest potential investors that to start with their money is safe. Secondly, they get a better return than what they would get, let's say, in a, in a bank deposit. So in the light of that, private investors would get attracted to business houses than to academic institutes. Thank you. Thank you. I will request Professor Jain to comment on this particular uh, matter. Uh, Professor Rao, uh, why I... And one more question I would like to ask you. Yeah. Is, uh, how many central universities could take the benefit of Window 3? Yeah, maximum, maximum number of central universities now for their, you know, uh, uh, augmenting their physical infrastructure for buildings. Okay. It's only through uh, window three. Okay. Except in the case of EWS. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, when the uh, uh, economical, uh, when the reservation was announced for economically weaker sections. So mm -hmm. under EWS, uh, policy of the government, they are funding the additional infrastructure for classrooms and some like other academic buildings under window four, where the government will take the responsibility. Yeah, Essentially, it is in the form of a grant, actually. But in the, under window three, depending on the financial health of the university, the quantum of funding is, is, is given. 
and uh, this is not only specific now to central universities, all centrally funded institutions, whether it is IITs or ISERs, ISERs and IITs or whatever. No, but how they will generate the funds to repay? You see, the government is still meeting its obligation by by uh, paying the interest component, but yeah. the, but the but the principal is going to be paid by the institution concerned. Yeah, that's why I'm saying that that plans are required. Otherwise, it will be very difficult. Sir, sir, uh, uh, you, uh, since you were also heading that uh, Central yeah. University of Rajasthan, you would bear with me that earlier the entire funding, even for you know buildings, etc., used to be from the University Grants Commission. Yeah, exactly. Right, or from MHRD. Uh, in the case of IITs, but now that is no more the case. Yeah, yeah. Universities will have to fend for themselves. They will have to generate enough, you know, uh, internal resources to pay for the principal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it is true. I mean, the, the, uh, the rules and regulations are so, uh, you know, enabling in a, in, a, in a way that, you know, you have to pay the principal over a 10 year period. So let us say a university uh, of a moderate size with 4,000 or 5,000 students, and if it is generating about 18 to 19 crores to its students' fees, then 10% of that is hardly what? 1.8 crore, one point, you know, something. So you can easily get a loan of 150 crore. Yeah. And in fact, of of the, yeah, in fact, most of the institutions are, uh, uh, you know, taking advantage of this. Just to address Professor Rao's uh, you know, well, he said that it's not a question. This was a very welcome comment. But notwithstanding the fact that the majority of us uh, who have benefited from, from the, uh, you know, highly subsidized education system and the fact that, you know, time and again, successive governments have declared the education as a public good and world over, I think uh, that is the majority view. But I think uh, this can no longer be, you know, the case uh, in times to come. Uh, already, if you look at the startup culture, in the startup policy of government of India, you're already allow allowing the venture capital to come in. I mean, the startup may be successful, may not be successful, but people are willing to put money in, in the startup ecosystem, in the, you know, for, for innovation, for incubation. There are lots of industries. I do know I have traveled around the country and there are many private universities which are doing very well in terms of engaging with the industry and getting support from the industry for their incubation or innovation uh, activities. I do not see any reason why on a limited scale for certain programs, for certain programs, the educational institutions, if they have access to this private equity for, uh, you know, for certain professional programs where there is a scope for, uh, you know, a bit of uh, revenue generation, I don't see any reason why we should not go for it. No, we, sh we can go for it, sir. I mean, nothing wrong with it, but uh, are there going to be any takers? I think that is where the challenge is going to be because the kind of money that is pumped into startups you know, considering the very low percentage of success rate, sure. uh, it will it will be a drop in the ocean, sir. I mean, to ra to run an university, uh, you know, as especially private universities without any support from government, mm -hmm. is a tall order. You know, the money which we can no, get from. You. I agree with you. I'm not saying that you go whole hog. I, I think for certain programs, for certain programs, which uh, uh, you know one thinks that perhaps it can generate uh, revenue, right, um, then uh, one should try it out. Yeah. Mean, at, and, least, yeah. at least this option should be available. There should not be a blanket ban uh, that you cannot access the private equity. Yeah, I was only highlighting the, the challenges we are likely to encounter. And also with regard to getting money from either alumni or uh, from philanthropists, I still feel India has not ris risen to that state as of now, uh, compared to advanced countries like UK and US. So it, I mean, I know it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a very challenge for every one of us, especially in the private universities. Uh, you need to attract students by offering quality products, you know, which will ensure quality placement uh, and by engaging in prudent financial management, the little money you get from various sources, you have to spend it wisely 
you know, to cater to various competing needs of education and research. And in the new education policy, there is so much that talked about the uh, faculty, you know, how to attract and retain high caliber faculty, you know, to, to for example, to offer, say, seventh pay uh, salaries in the private universities, because, you know, that will push up the cost structure quite yeah. substantially. Um, yeah, th this, these are the challenges. I agree with uh, Professor Vinod Jain. Yes, governments uh, all over the world are trying to distancing themselves, you know, from these uh, academic institutes so that they can reduce the funding. And uh, if nobody misunderstands, certain times government these days all over, not just in India, they are looking at where do I get votes from? So naturally, they would like to spend the money uh, with in, in places where they are likely to get into power and not necessarily looking at the good of the society as a whole. So it's, I mean, it's easier said than done. I know the education right. policy was bold enough, but let's see how things are going to unfold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rao. And uh, see, only five minutes are left to close the session. <laughs> so I have to conclude the session. And I would like to thank Professor Tirak, Professor Gupta, and Professor Jain for their excellent presentation and innovative ideas. From the presentation, we can conclude that financing of higher education has grown through almost revolutionary changes during the past decade. These are the only few examples. We are not sure whether all these changes, especially the emphasis on accountability and marketization will lead to sustainable welfare of the societies. When Margaret Thatcher introduced the value for money concept in British higher education, there was uncertainty that is might lead to reduced innovation and excellence. 14 years later, the Higher Education Funding Council of England OECD meeting mentioned that the outcome that they did not notice any reduction in innovative capacity of the system or any reduction in the quality of the higher education being delivered in spite of significant increase in enrollment without matching increase in expenditure. It is also observed that countries and institutions, they are trying to meet the demand of education in various ways financially. And Dr. Gupta, Dr. Jain, and Turk has explained very nicely all these things. Some private sector organization, including institutions of higher education are funding higher education for profit making business. In respect of developing countries, we have to remain alert to what extent marketability can be welcome in resource poor developing countries. Uh, at the end, I would like to say there are some, uh, recently there is was a science and technology policy by Professor Ashutosh. And he has given some innovative ways. He is talking about this free journals available to all the universities. And that is one Good thing, I think we should uh, discuss all this particular aspect. And one more thing being served in the open university system also, I think online education, education may help us as far as the finances are concerned. And this is another thing and it will be uh, in some certain cases, at least it will be marginal cost education that thing we have to consider. Now, at the end, I would like to thank all the resource persons for delivering. And this is a very important topic. And we should continue deliberation how we'll generate more and more resources to have more quality in higher education. Thank you. Thank you all for active participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the very enriching session, sir. The discussion has raised many important issues and there was some very